It's Tony Football Show on the 11th of April. And here in the studio, with a busy show ahead of us, hey, Tom Williams, good to see you again. Hello, James, good to see you as ever. Nice. We've got Duncan Alexander. Hello, James. Hello, Duncan. And hello, Raphael Honigstein. Hello, James. Ooh. Nice. Richardson. Yep. Hello, you listener. Going to chat some Road to Wembley today, that's for sure. Hey, Duncan, blow me if you haven't just been to, mm. you know, the nation's premium the footballing football. edifice. Yeah. Mm. What yeah. were you doing there? Uh, I was at the, the EFL trophy final. Um, not quite the Champions League final, but, you know, a, a trophy was awarded. But sadly not to Wickham, oh. uh, who managed to concede uh, a sort of 95th minute mm. goal from a deep cross that dropped in. Think David Seaman and Ronaldinho 2002. Um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen it since because I refuse to even acknowledge right. it happened. But yeah. Heartbreaking, though. Yeah, it was all late goals, wasn't it? Three goals after at the 85th? Yeah, it was nil nil at 85 minutes. They scored. Wickham equalised. Who who are they? Peterborough. Okay. Peterborough oh. United scored. Posh. Um, and then Wickham equalised. And it was like, OK, there's going to be extra time. and But there wasn't. So it's a strange competition because I don't think anyone at the group stage really thinks about it at all, even the players. And then you get to the final and it's a quite a big occasion. And mm. yeah, no one likes losing cup finals in the 95th minute. Right, particularly at Wembley. I think there's going to befall one team, of course, uh, early June when the Champions League finale rolls into town. Rafa, you were at the Emirates I on was, Tuesday. Yeah. I remember you saying... The only Bayern fan allowed in. <laughs> Well, yeah, although there were one or two Hello, other VIPs. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. were about 200 VIPs 200, and, right. uh, and WAGs. Nice. There were also 11 fully fit and functioning Bayern players, which was a bit of a surprise. You were saying on Monday... Pleasant surprise. Hmm, you, were, you were so downcast that you felt you'd be happy just to still be in the tie after this first leg. And, and boy, are you. Yeah, um, Bayern turned up. They played a version of Tuchel ball that was very effective, uh, quite uh, underdoggy, if that is uh, indeed an adjective, an adverb, either way. <laughs> Surely there's a German word, if nothing mm. else. Uh, well, you spoke to, I'm not sure. Well, you spoke to the Ram Deuter, Dr. Ram, whatever his name is, uh, Thomas, Thomas Muller, yeah. after the game, and he used a choice expression for the Bayern approach, didn't he? Uh, remind me because he's wasn't said it a few about things. humility? Yeah, I asked him whether Bayern did have a different attitude to this game, mm. thinking we are the underdogs, let's play like an underdog team with the humility that kind of goes with it and the work rate. And he said, yeah, uh, but humility is always is always good. And perhaps I think the implication was maybe that's been lacking uh, in some of the more mundane. Affair. Spine have turned up by and large in the Champions League, which suggests that maybe motivation is a, is a factor for their yeah. uh, poor domestic performance. Um, but crucially, they came up against a very good team, which allowed them to sit back and play differently. If you, you can't play like that against Köln on Saturday, because Köln will also just sit back and no one will touch the ball, mm. a bit like that um, uh, Simpsons meme. Mm. Um, so. It works. It works when a team come on to them. They have great players to play on the break, as we saw with Leroy Sané and uh, Serge Gnabry had a good game, sadly got injured, will miss the second leg. And they had a bit of fight and they had a bit of aggression. They were a little bit dirty. They were a bit street smart. Had a bit of Harry Kane, didn't they? A little bit of Harry Kane. uh, Completely accidental, of course. Oh, the elbow. The connection Mm. between elbow and... uh, Apple, Apple, Adam's Apple. Adam's Apple, yeah. yeah. Adam's yeah. Apple of Gabriel. But yeah, um, a lot of people, uh, including one member of this pod, a lot happier than, than they thought they might be after this first leg. Mm, there you go. It was a terrific match. I think all four games were really. We had 18 goals scored across the uh, first legs, which is the joint most ever at this stage of the Champions League. Tuesday, the 2-2 between Arsenal and FC Bayern at the Emirates. 3-3, meanwhile, between Real Madrid and Man City at the Bernabeu. On Wednesday, Atletico Madrid 2-1 winners against Dortmund, but that game 
still wide open, as is probably PSG Barcelona, which first leg of which ended 2-3. Or, if you like, uh, real Barcelona values 2, not so real Barcelona values 3. <laughs> hey, Tom. I mean, that was the uh, intriguing subplot to Wednesday's game, uh, the pre-match press conference during which Luis Enrique was asked who out of him and Xavi best represented Barcelona's values rather than being diplomatic and you know sort of not really answering he just said no me definitely me look at the kind of football we play look at the way we control possession look mm. at all the trophies I've won it's definitely me um, and obviously that kind of backfired in the sense that he then lost the game right. but in terms of the approach that the two sides took, mm. I think PSG's approach was a bit more kind of classically Barcelona. Mm. And then they were trying to impose themselves, trying to control possession, etc. Barcelona played a little bit more uh, smartly, counterattacked a little bit more, and ended up winning the game. Um, and once again, this morning, it's Luis Enrique's uh, tactical choices that are in the spotlight again as they often have been this season because every time PSG are about to play a game of any sort of importance um, you have no idea what he's going to do with the starting 11 there's right. always some kind of surprise right. last night he had Marquinhos at right back he had Marco Asensio as a false nerve and he had to kind of rejig things at half time and Did ultimately you say false nerve false nerve sorry oh no oh, sorry. Oh, oh, I excuse my friend I got caught between English and French as what a false about, as a false nine. So they kiss. call it a false nerf. They call it a, well, they call it a faux nerf. A faux yeah. nerf. A faux nerf. Yeah, 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 okay. yeah. A false nerf. I yeah. mean, he kind of was a false nerf. Oh. I should have just I should have doubled down. Yeah, like Marco said it was a false nerf, and as it turned out, it didn't work. So he right. had to rejig things at half time, right. and then it briefly did work, but then ultimately it did not work. Okay, not sure if he best embodies Barcelona values. Certainly embodying embodying PSG values in that he took the lead against. Barcelona but allowed the Catalans to come back. Rafa. Can I just ask if we should go into a bit more of the penalty stuff yeah. at Arsenal? I think people are very excited yeah. about all of that. Are the penalty stuff for Arsenal? The penalty controversies. From Arsenal? From the Arsenal Oh, yeah, yeah we will. We're getting back we'll come to back. that. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, fine. yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, this is still the preliminary chat. No, no, I mean, I think we can <laughs> no. now chat about no. the shit, but we'll come back it's to that. It's more of a can full I'm... preliminary. Yeah. Full preliminary, there we go. Raf, don't worry, we will be coming back to oh, that. Good, good. We will good. be coming back to that. Um, Raf, you're making it sound like we're disorganised. At that point, uh, if you'll, you know, excuse the... Hey. Oh, sorry, Duncan. I mean, to Tom's point about values, um, and your oh. point a minute ago about most joint most goals at this, you know, first oh, legs yeah. of the quarterfinal... Producer Charlie's point, I should. Oh, well, well done, Producer Charlie, um, reading on the old internet. Um, <laughs> it was uh, it equals... Shots fired. <laughs> 2011. But which, Duncan's microphone is mysteriously yeah. cut. Um, 2010-11, which obviously uh, the final was a Pep Guardiola team at Wembley, so there was a little bit of thing there. Nice. And who was in midfield for his team there? Chavi, embodying the old Barcelona. But to Tom's point, mm. Barcelona were quite direct. Um, Chavi was there in a Stone Island jumper. I think if you'd have gone back to someone in 2011 and said, in 13 years' time, Chavi will kind of be like a cool Euro Pulis. Um people would be surprised. And mm. Pep Guardiola would be playing with four centre-backs yeah. and a big lummox up front. Yeah. What's happened to our is, game? Is, is, Manchester, is this Manchester revival taking over the planet? It's the only explanation. Mm. Were you quite impressed with Barcelona, whoever's values they were embodying? Yeah, I was. I think particularly because, I mean, their recent form since Xavi announced yeah, that he was turning was, his it? back on Barcelona's values mm. in a way uh, by announcing that he was leaving. They've been unbeaten. Um, I think what helped was that they had... Um, you know, Frankie de Jong back from injury mm. and they're a very different team when, when he is there. And, and also Pedri, Pedri, also back from injury, comes was, off the yeah. bench and with his first touch plays one of the passes of the Champions League season to set Rafinha through for his second goal um, and Barcelona's equaliser. Right. And then he sends on uh, Andreas Christensen and almost with his first touch, he ends up heading the winner past right. a troublingly statuesque really Gianluigi Donnarumma. It's it? not very Barcelona at all, but you kind of felt like the key decisions, he got more of them right than Luis Enrique did, probably. Um, yeah, a team in all yellow scoring from a corner is very League One, I'd say. Mm. But mm. All right, excellent. League One, not League uh. Thanks. Mm. I did notice that. 
pronunciation Ad- difference. Advantage Barcelona there. Then the other game on that side of the bracket, Raf, was the Atletico Dortmund game, which saw Dortmund in complete panic in the first half, going 2 0 down. I think they described, one of their players was describing it as almost two own goals. No? Yeah. That's but then a stirring system. recovery in the second half, which leaves things delicately poised. Yeah, they, they did roar back, uh, as it were, and uh, played, played some really good stuff. Atletico tired. First, they did that Atletico thing later than usual, which is to say, OK, we're leading, let's just stop playing football. They did it quite late by their standards, but looked a little bit dead on their feet. And Dortmund created chances. The subs that Terzic brought on really made a huge difference. Um, Brun, Jamie Bynou Gittin, Sebastian Allaire, the goal scorer. And Dortmund, in the end, came super close to snatching an equaliser mm-hmm. with Julian Brandt and uh, Bynou Gittin hitting, po- hitting the bar in the last five minutes or so. And they feel a real sense of, of belief. Uh, but you're right. I mean, they were absolutely terrible in the first 30 minutes at the back gave away ridiculous goals, made one more mistake, which wasn't punished um, from, by Hummels in the second half. But, yeah, it's not, it's not the worst result. They roar back, but back in the roar, mm. how will they fare? Only one goal mm. between them. And Atletico's record on the road, it's rubbish. I mean, you've probably got numbers. I think in the Champions League, it's one win in the last seven away games. They don't have to yeah. win this because they've got a goal advantage. In La Liga, it's poor as well. And... Mm. You can sort of see why, because um, this is a different Atletico to the, the stereotype that we've all gotten used to. Uh, the 1-0, nothing happens, you might as, well, might as well stop playing. They're much more expensive, they're much more open, easy on the eye, but also a lot more vulnerable. And, um, and the back three with uh, Witzel, Aspiliqueta and Jimenez, not super fast and athletic uh, at this point. And um, which might explain why they're a little bit suspect. Interesting. By the way, on the subject of Dortmund and Champions League quarterfinals, today's the 11th of April. Seven years ago, Raf, was that incredible pre-game to Dortmund's clash with Monaco when, when the Dortmund bus was hit by one bomb with luckily only one player, Mark Batra, and, and a policeman injured. But the, the backstory to that whole... Incident. I mean, a horrifying incident, and the game rightly was suspended. But um, the backstory was quite extraordinary. Yeah, it was um, a guy who'd bet on the derivatives market that the Dortmund shares would would take a big hit, which they would have if he'd killed, succeeded in killing the whole team. Luckily, luckily he didn't. Um, yeah, absolutely insane story. Um, and also the genesis of the big breakdown between Tuchel and his relationship to uh, the people in charge because he later claimed that they had made him play and uh, there was a real disagreement of what the official version was, how this game was effectively played um, the, next played? The, next the next day. The next day, yes. Wow. Yeah. Should it have been played or not? Um, and they kind of accused each other of of sort of bending the truth a little bit, mm. both Tuchel and the board, and there was no coming back after that. So the fallout could have been much worse, of course, but it did leave, um, yeah, leave a big mark. Um, it would have been a lot more infamous, of course, if worse things would have happened, mm. but it's one of the craziest stories ever in the Champions League. Definitely. All right. Uh, next up. Let's get on to what happened to Man City away in Madrid and also follow up on the, uh, the talking points from the Emirates on Tuesday. Mm. Tuesday night, Rafa, while you were at the Emirates, what a game was taking place at the Bernabeu. Real Madrid 3, Man City 3 it finished. Manchester City continuing their remarkable record this year of scoring exactly three goals in every single Champions League fixture they've had. Uh, but anyway, how much fun was this? A lot. Mm. A lot, yeah. I mean, from that cheeky free kick from Bernardo Silva, two minutes. Yeah, in. I mean, the first thing that happens in the game, uh, Jack Grealish back in the starting eleven, driving run down the inside left channel, wins a free kick for a foul by Aurelien Chouameni, filling in at centre back, now suspended for the return leg, and then Bernardo Silva whips it in at the near post, and Andre Lunin gets across, gets a hand to it, but can't keep it out. Um, it's a dream start for City, but then Madrid kind of took control, scored a couple of 
Um, slightly scruffy goals themselves. Hmm. Deflected Eduardo Camavinga shot for the equaliser. Then Rodrigo Goyce runs in behind I feel another Rodrigo, deflected shot. I feel that deserves more credit than just it's a deflected shot. He nutmegs whoever the city... Did. Was it a can- It a was Kanji. a Kanji who gets yeah. back to him. Yeah, I guess it's because the problem is... I mean, it was very nicely constructed. Yeah. And a Kanji exploiting the absence of Kyle Walker, which mm. was a massive factor for City, mm. uh, as you would you know, probably expect uh, for, for a game like that against that kind of opposition. Runs through behind a Kanji. Um, a Kanji gets back... And Rodrigo has a shot that kind of, I think, does it goes through a Kanji's legs. It does, yeah. But but flicks it off him, off his, off and it also foot. flicks flicks off Ortega's heel and P rolls over the line, which makes mm. it look a little bit less spectacular. Did you know how slow the crowd were to celebrate the goal, though, because the ball was rolling into an empty net, and mm. no one really jumps up and down until it's in in the goal. I guess they're worried about it, you know, in the post maybe. Or mm. so the reverse of sucking the ball in, they were worried about keeping it out. Mm. Mm. Anyway, so that was 2-1 And then Foden Foden Yeah, I mean, I thought Madrid played really well For the first hour And something that occurred to me watching this game And kind of half watching the Arsenal Bayern game Was that I think In the Champions League The elite English clubs Come up against a a quality Of counter-attack that they don't Encounter very often in the Premier League You know Raf made the point about Bayern not getting many opportunities to play on the counter in Germany because they're Bayern Munich. But you look at that forward line, you know, Sane, Gnabry, Musiala, with Harry Kane, you know, playing the passes for them. Same for Real Madrid. One of the most devastating counter-attacking teams around, if you give them the chance, with you know, Vinicius Junior and Rodrigo, and then that, that four-man midfield and Bellingham, although we didn't have a great game in, in the number 10 position. And they, they did a really good job of sort of shutting City down in midfield and playing on the break. And then they just kind of run out of puff. Mm. And City had pushed them back so successfully that first when Foden gets the ball on the edge of the box and then when a few minutes later Josco Gvardiol gets the ball on the edge of the box, they're, they're much closer to goal than you would expect to be if a team are are keeping their opponents at arm's length successfully. Mm. Like if Foden picks the ball up 30 yards from goal, he's never going to shoot. But if he's literally on the, on the edge of the box, then he will, which is what he did. And Guardiola did the same. Um, City take the lead. And then Madrid equalised with a fantastic goal from Fede Valverde. Yeah. I mean, to be fair to uh, Madrid, City taking shots from outside the box is probably a bit of a rarity. And they might have just not prepared for it. Um, I mean, the fact that that, that Tony Cruz didn't even really try and yeah. close down Guardiola suggests that I think part of it was thinking, well, a it's Josco Guardiola, yeah. b he's Punch on his right thing. foot, yeah. I'm probably safe here. I don't think even Josco Guardiola knew that he was capable of hitting the ball like that with his right foot. But mm. I think it spoke to the extent to which Madrid had kind of run out of gas by that point. Like they were they weren't even defending the edge of their own box properly. Um, and it was no surprise that I think Cruz was was hooked immediately, um, and Modric came on. Oh yeah, Brahim Diaz came on for Rodrigo, and that mm. gave Madrid a, a bit of impetus, and that Fresh that impetus. helped them go on and, and get the equaliser. So three three, but very much advantage City. Would you not say? I mean, in, in Given the what sen- happened last time that they advantage City in the sense that it's a home game, but mm. not in in the way it would have been when we still had the dear old dearly departed. Away goals. Away goals rule. Mm. Because as someone pointed out in a a tweet uh, that did some big numbers, the abolition of the away goals rule means that the score lines in each of the first legs that finished level are kind of meaningless now. He's worked out what a draw is, basically. He's worked out what a draw is, basically. a good moment in life, that. I mean, I kind of agree. I understand why they've done away with the away goals rule, but I do kind of miss... The, the very unique kind of suspense right. that it used to create. Right. Okay. Uh, City, though, who will be facing a Real Madrid team that they beat 4 0 on their last visit to the Etihad, a Real Madrid side that will be without Schermany. They might themselves, City, be without Carl Walker still. Kevin De Bruyne's absence, we're not Ill. sure about that. Mm. So I would have thought, you would have thought he'll be back. Mm. There's a nasty cough going around. So. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think De Bruyne has been. That important for City this season. I mean, um, Foden this is last weekend. Did you were you across that at all? Yeah, Palace. I must admit, when I saw the team sheet, I was like, "Wow, 
Peppers. He is passing the baton on. I mean, Foden to Foden, and right. actually, then it found out twenty two goals. This De Bruyne season. had a dicky People tummy. Are, that is impressive. Mm. Um, six from outside the box. So. The right. goal was incredible. Yeah, and to see Guardiola react like that, which you rarely do mm. for when one of his own team's goals. He gets in Foden's face. He does, and with his big expensive watch. You know what he looked like? What was the name of the Russian raver who was informed of some news and immediately celebrates? Ref, uh, Pep looked like that, but mm-hmm. speeded oh, the, up a bit. Yeah. What was his name? Oh, yeah. Dimitri was his name. Obviously, Pep was a little bit more animated. What was the news that he found out, Dimitri? When, well, uh, for, he found out Phil Foden's going to become very good at goal scoring in a few years' time. And right. He was like, Carlo Ancelotti, meanwhile, reacting to Fede Valverde's equally extraordinary volley mm. with a quick shake out of the cuffs and then business as usual. Good for him. Well, we'll see what happens next week. All square between Real and Man City, all square between Arsenal and Bayern and Raphael. Let's return. Uh, two big penalty controversies you wanted to talk about. One involving Saka in the 95th minute. For you a pen, Raph? Not a pen. Not for me, neither. Um, Anybody else, Duncan? Seen given. And I, I know that Saka does move his leg, but if it, you were going to hurt... He kicks Manuel If you're going to hurdle the goalkeeper, which many people said he should have, then you're still going to have to move your leg. You're not going to move your leg directly up. No. So. What I believe happens... And Rafa, you can maybe th- shed some light on this from Manuel Neuer perspective. He comes steaming out, but being Manuel Neuer, who's played a bit, goes, no, I'm not going to concede a penalty here. So he steams out. So Saka thinks, oh, I can win a penalty here. And then just stops. So Saka's, oh, he's not where I want him to be. I better go and, and he throws his knee out and essentially knees Manuel Neuer. Yeah, I mean, he, Neuer does put a leg out. So there is a there is movement towards the player. He's not right. just completely passive and neutral. Yeah. But I think the way that Saka takes off before the contact, rather than the contact sort of bringing him down. Yeah. yeah. That's where the referee thinks this is not actually a foul. He's mm. not being yeah. stopped Saka from. Been... He could have gone left. He could have gone somewhere else. But he kind of runs into Neuer. But I agree. I mean, you could. If this happens, if it, let's put it this way, if, this, if it's not the 95th minute, mm. I think the referee takes a lot more time right. to deliberate, maybe looks at it again. I think he decided, okay, fine, I've had Got enough controversy for today. Yeah. In, enough kids' mistake, as he put it. Right. Uh, so uh, let's not... Point um, that because a lot of people didn't realise about the other one, yeah. but he did, obviously. Well, and I think that might have influence as the well. The other one. The other one being the moment when... Play begins, play is active. David Rea kicks the ball across to his teammate, Gabriel, who casually picks the ball up. Cue various Bayern players gesticulating wildly to the referee and Thomas Tuchel as well. They were referencing the lesser-known handball ro- uh, rule. Take us through that one. Uh, well, if you're William Webb Ellis in the 19th though? century, it's fine. Or was it a fine. natural? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a natural a, body position. It was, it was ball to hand. So um. <laughs> I did, a reaction to this has been uh, eventually widespread at the time. Nobody was none the wiser except for Bayern Munich. Uh, you, could see, uh, you could see that um, the, the, immediately the Bayern players turned mm. to the ref and then at the next break they were all surrounding him and the bench mm. went absolutely crazy. I mean, it didn't take a lot for Tuchel to get very irate at the, the touchline in this game. He was, he was on it the whole time. But um, yeah, they, they couldn't believe it. Fine. Should it have been a pen... Tom, or is that the kind of thing you don't want to see deciding a football match? Well, I mean, the referee obviously decided that it was not, uh, you know, a serious enough offence. He could see that it was a silly mistake and you don't want a game of this magnitude to pivot on, you know, a, a, a defender's you brain shouldn't fade. shouldn't the ball up then, surely. But there is an argument that if you're stupid enough to touch the ball with your hands when the referee's just blown his whistle, you deserve to concede a penalty. What do you think Gabriel was... Well, what was his... well that, an explanation has emerged, okay. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to credit the Twitter user with a really uh, sort of unhelpfully long name. I am not at Dakodak French Guna, who has tweeted a video showing that this is how Arsenal particularly when they're trying to wind down the clock, hmm. take all their goal kicks. Oh. David Raya generally has the ball in his hands in the middle of his goal. He rolls it to his left. Hmm. Gabriel picks it up or stops it with his hands. 
spots it on the corner of the six-yard box and then kicks it back inside to Raya yeah, which and is... Arsenal play out. The difference yeah. on Tuesday night was that rather than rolling it to Gabriel, making it clear the goal kick had not yet been taken, mm. Raya right. seems to take the... I mean, Raya obviously does take the goal kick and Gabriel's in kind of slow down uh, goal kick taking mode oh. and so the brain fade occurs. Interesting. It's not just Arsenal and it's not... It's not really to slow the game down. The reason that it happens quite a lot now, and it is a very modern development in football since the goal kick rule changes, is because if you pass it back to the keeper who's in the middle of the six-yard box, it's harder to press him because you know he can basically use the width of the pitch rather than being on one side of the box. I thought you weren't allowed to pass back to the keeper. No, you, the goal kick you take to the keeper who's in the middle of the goal. Right. So then rather than having the ball on the edge of the box, one side, where mm. it's easier for the opposition to press him, mm. he has the whole of the... Um, right. So it, it's, in, you know, you see it in a lot of different games, but to, to the point Tom was making, and all the Twitter users with the long name, you know, normally Rea does sort of a, quite extravagantly roll it or throw it to the centre half, but this time he just, he just yeah. passed it. I mean, I still don't understand why they do that. Why mm. the rolling thing happens? Who could just Gabriel could just take it from that from that spot yeah. to begin with? Yeah, and it's, it's quite um, ostentatious. <laughs> well, it could be a signal. Yeah, of you could know. Be. Of mm. what but the difference to do. is, and this is where might, the confusion might have come in for right. Gabriel. Yes, is that I didn't know this, but apparently the referee doesn't have to blow the whistle for a goal kick. Mm. He can just let it go. But mm. because it was a substitution directly before, Ooh. he did blow the whistle. Right. Okay. Which makes the offence look bigger in a way because mm. Mm. the whistle shows everyone game is in play. Whereas yeah. if you're still sort of mus- mucking around in the six-yard box, you can might say, okay, they still haven't find the right, found the right spot where to take the ball. But to answer your question, which you didn't ask me but others, yeah. um, I would s- say that this is more of an admin error than a, than a punishable Fair. offence. Yeah. Um, penalty suggests that you've done something wrong to mm. stop the opponents doing something that could lead to a goal which is why you're rewarded with a 75 percent chance to score yeah our friend dale johnson made a very good point there was an analogy in germany where in the early days of vr somebody kicked the ball out mm. uh, trying to shoot and one of the subs behind the goal stopped it from going out but they were still slightly on the line and the punishment for that funnily enough is a penalty and you might think that is a bigger offence, but in the same way, you feel the crime doesn't fit. Right. The punishment doesn't fit the crime. And I agree with the referee saying, okay. this is not School really. boy error. School Can boy you error. imagine the fumes, though, if that penalty had been given? Yeah. Not saying it should have been, but right. what a, I mean, it's been a, a bigger talking point as it is. But if it had actually led to a penalty... Mm. Bayern boy. did get a penalty, of course, in the game. And what a move... It was that led to it with um, Manuel Neuer uh, majorly involved again. Off down the wing they go and eventually Sané is brought down after whizzing past three or four, I think, Arsenal players. And Kane steps up for the penalty. Quite extraordinary, the impact on the noise levels when Harry Kane's kick goes in. Nothing, because there were no Bayern fans. And the oh, ones no, there was. There, you can hear there's this... You can hear all the Arsenal fans and then suddenly just silence, like yeah, pin drop. Nothing, as I said. Oh, nothing. I thought you meant there was no impact. No, yeah, no. Yeah, right. no. Okay. yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Because there were no Bayern fans, apart mm. from the 200, who had to be very quiet in their boxes. And I think they even had a, some kind of chaperone to, uh, to check that their celebrations weren't exuberant. There were a few sort of undercover Bayern fans who couldn't help themselves. And there really? were some fights and some of them were escorted out. Oh, really? And uh, it brings out really the, one of the best qualities of English fans who then tell the steward, <laughs> this guy, he's not, he's not one of ours. Throw him out. Get him out. Where were you, <laughs> Rafa? I was in the press box. Oh, I wasn't right, one okay. of those escorted well, of those, out, okay. no. Um, but... The penalty quite remarkable for a number Did of things. Did they check the labels of their jackets or something? Or nice accent. I think it's just the the fist bumps that kind of give right, it away. Right, okay. um, just before we go into the penalty detail, there was a great visual of the Kane penalty as well from b- behind him because all the Arsenal fans behind the goal, as mm. well as kind of goading him by shouting things, a lot of them were twirling their scarves in a very yeah. kind of old school, slightly nineteen, you know, sort of fifties way, and then the penalty hits the back of the net and. Silence descends, and all the scars come down, scars, which was a yeah, delightfully was so nice. forlorn image. David David Raya, though, quite remarkable how far he, he set off quite really. early, didn't he? Yeah. He did 
he did. And what I mean, uh, sorry, I think Rafa, you're going to talk about the, the the penalty in detail. But yeah, he he does go right. And Kane said early. afterwards that he knew that David Rea moves early, so he added a little little extra hop in his run up just to give David Rea a chance to set off and leave half the goal exposed. Yeah, I find that really interesting. That that Kane maybe that is normal, but you don't often hear, hear players of that sort of stature to talk about their talk about their preparations. And he said, yes, Rea went really early, so I decided to change my technique, and it's the first time. Mm. I think that he has taken a goalkeeper dependent uh, penalty mm. uh, because Leo usually just Tony. you know I know he usually just or, or Leo, Leo Messi mm. he usually just picks a spot and just smashes it, um, but that will make him make him a better taker I would suggest because it is I think statistically the more successful route of. Mm. Well, the, the Messi comparison is interesting because Messi started taking penalties like that and we noted, you know, most noticeably saw it at the 2022 World Cup because he wasn't very good at penalties. Like Messi's record on penalties was poor for a player as good as his. Um, whereas Kane has always been pretty good at penalties. Mm. It's okay, he's missed the occasional important one, but in the main, he's pretty good. So the thought that he now has another tool to his penalty Tool belt. Oh, that's right. Is Utility belt. Yeah, I'm not potentially sure. a terrifying one. Uh, tool bag. I'm uh, 39 goals in 38 games for Bayern this season. That's mad. 39 in 38, and in games against Arsenal, it's 15 in 20 for Harry Kane. He, I think it's worth saying that he played really well mm. um, beyond beyond that penalty. Some wonderful passes. Let the line really effectively on what was a difficult night for a centre forward because Bayern didn't have a lot of possession. I think um, only about 40%, which is really low for them. Um, but he turned up, as um, as did most of the Bayern. Yeah, yeah, ah, as did most of the Bayern. Uh, nah. I think well, he's he's English, uh, English footballers aren't capable of such skill he's sort of and he's trying to usher the beer yeah. away from yeah. Gabriel. Is, is it worth making a comparison between his interpretation of the centre forward role that night and one of uh, the Lummox which I think you were describing earlier one Erling Haaland away at the Bernabeu or is that unfair? Well I mean if you look at um, I mean I think you can you can add Robert Lewandowski into the mix mm. as well as one of the you know the elite centre forwards of the modern era and his role I thought last night for, for Barcelona was quite Harry Kane like in that I think when you know when we occasionally make facile and unnecessary Kane v Lewandowski comparisons. One of the things that gets pointed out a lot is Kane's all-round game, his ability to drop deep, play as a 10, which is not something we associate so much with Lewandowski. But he did that really well last mm. night. And it was a big part of the way that, that Barca approached the game was that they looked to hit him early. And he, I mean, he was you know, dealing with 20-year-old Lucas Baraldo, who looked out of his depth a little bit. But Lewandowski played really well, has a big role in... A Barca's opener that Rafinha ends up scoring. Um, so Lewandowski doesn't score, but has a big, a big impact on his game. Harry Kane, obviously, major impact on his game. And Haaland was, I mean, a completely mm. non-existent, really, for City, in the way that he is when he doesn't score. Um, and, I mean, you know, obviously, we all know what, what, what a fantastic player he is, but I think there is... Do uh, we? I mean... Yes, come on. Legal Look at last season. But I think what is becoming more and more apparent is that in the sort of the rarefied air of the Champions League mm. knockout rounds, he he does he doesn't have quite the same impact. You know, he didn't score at all in the latter phase of the Champions League last season. Here we are again, yeah. City looking for him to produce the goods, and he was oh, you know right. anonymous. Yeah. Six shots on target against Madrid in his career, and no goals. Mm. Will he fare better this weekend against Luton? You wonder. Hey, well, what about Mbappe? Mbappe mm. also, what also hopeless. Yeah, yeah. He got a three from the keep today. A three? A three. There were twos, though. There were twos, but he, Who he got, got the a twos? three. got twos? Lucas Beraldo got a two. I think, did Donnarumma get a two? Oh, yeah. It was oh, a two-e, three kind of vibe. But yeah, Mbappe was is it a anonymous. a Champions League game without a Donnarumma? <laughs> but this is the thing. Right. I mean, <laughs> it happens... It happens all the time in the Champions League, but he's been really good this season, Donnarumma. And the kind of the the feeling has been that he has, you know, sort of he's kind of gone up a level. He hasn't been making mistakes in the league. He's been excellent, mm. and then he's at fault in different ways for each of the three goals that Barcelona scored last yeah. night. And he does something seems to go wrong for him in the Champions League. Let me just finish off our Champions League chat, if I may, by asking Rafa. You wanted the tie between Arsenal. 
and FC Bayern to be alive going into the second leg. How much life do you see in it there in Madrid? Oh, it's, it's super alive for both Alfonso sides. Alfonso Davis is going to be missing. Alfonso Davis missing, Gnabry missing. Mm. Um, and it's not a huge advantage for Bayern, uh, A, because the game is only drawn and the away goal rule no longer exists, but also because you can imagine Arsenal being just as effective um, on the break and creating chances away to Bayern when they cannot sit back and play the game that has worked best for them under Thomas Tuchel. I think this is a point worth making that all the the most sort of convincing performances have come uh, domestically when Bayern played that style against Dortmund and Stuttgart, the only teams that really took them on against Leverkusen, they tried, it didn't work out in a different formation. And in the Champions League, where they've also been a little bit less sort of uh, proactive, if you will, mm. and often played on the break. So um, it's probably a, a style that might take them quite far in this competition, but they have to overcome what I think will be a very difficult night in Munich as well. OK. For that, Arsenal have got Premier League duties. They're going to be hosting Aston Villa this weekend in that ever so exciting domestic title race. Let's get on to that next. All right, the Premier League, so, so tight. Arsenal and Liverpool, a point ahead of Man City, coming into round 33, I think, officially, but very much depends on your fixture list. City are going to play first this weekend, Saturday at 3 o'clock. They're at home to Luton. Sunday at 2, Liverpool then host Crystal Palace. And at 4.30 on Sunday, as mentioned, Arsenal get a visit from Aston Villa. Elsewhere... Newcastle are up against Tottenham Saturday lunchtime. Down the other end of the table, you've got Brentford four points off the drop facing Sheffield United. That's a Saturday three o'clock kickoff. Nottingham Forest, who are just goal difference outside of the bottom three, host Wolves also at three, while second from bottom Burnley host Brighton. Everton, who are now just two points from trouble after this week's further two-point penalty, are at Chelsea on Monday night. Uh, this weekend's Saturday Tea Time Entertainment, in the tradition of Cracker Jack and others, we'll see uh, Man United visiting Bournemouth, while West Ham Fulham is Sunday at 2 o'clock and not on the telly. Uh, OK, top three. Arsenal against Villa, City against Luton, Liverpool Palace. Three wins, or are we in for twists and turns? And if so, where? Duncan. You would imagine, in order of difficulty, mm. City have got the or reverse order. City have got the easiest task, right. then Liverpool, then Arsenal. Right. But that's but. complicated by the fact Villa play this evening, Thursday yeah, evening, in true. the Conference League, um, hosting Lille. Yeah, Paolo Fonseca's mob. Um, so I saw some Arsenal fans say that it, you know, all the other Champions League quarter finalists are playing on Saturday this week ahead of the next games. But you know, Arsenal get two days more than Villa to prepare. So. Mm. That's true. Yeah, it's... Um, this is a game that Villa won. 1-0 in December. John McGinn with the goal. It also marks Unai Emery's first visit to the Emirates with supporters there, because the other one came during lockdown. So, um, yeah, that's going to be interesting to see how he, how he is received. You mentioned Man City against Luton being potentially the easiest of the three. These two sides faced each other at Kenilworth Road back in February in the FA Cup. Do you remember what happened there? Yeah, Erling Haaland scored lots of goals. He scored five goals. Five. Definitive proof that maybe Real Madrid are better at football than Luton Town. Possibly so. Definitely, Poss maybe. Mm. Possibly. 6-2 that one ended. And Liverpool Crystal Palace. Liverpool got a great record against Palace, although everyone remembers a certain game at Selhurst Park. But it's actually 11 wins and two draws and no defeats in their last 13 meetings with the Eagles. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, on paper, you would back the the three title contenders to all win. I think it's a shame for, you know, drama fans that this isn't kind of mid-season Aston Villa, um, you know, who beat Arsenal, who beat City, who look favourites to finish in the top four at that point. You look at their recent form, only one win in the last five um, and Ollie Watkins was quite critical of the team and its sort of callowness after the the three three draw against Brentford last time out. So they're not quite 
firing on all cylinders as, as they were a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, Liverpool, Palace, City, Luton. It's hard to see either of those going any way other than home wins. Although Luton are, you know, beat Bournemouth last weekend, you know, caused a f- problems for Arsenal prior to that, caused problems for Spurs prior to that. So they're not, I don't expect them to roll over and have their bellies tickled right. quite as 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 they did in the cup game. Yeah. Um, Producer Charlie's got an important point on this. This is actually Luton's first visit to Man City since a 2-0 defeat at Main Road in what we now called, call League One. Uh, that was 25 years ago, almost to the day. It was actually on the 14th of April. I think this game's going to be on the 13th of April. What was number one back then? 13th of April, 1999. Spice Girls? It was actually flat beat by Mr. Oizo. Oh, well, that takes me back. Oh, it's from the Levi's. Uh, Levi's advert. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Excellent. Hey, uh, Crystal Palace visiting Liverpool, Sunday 2 o'clock, Raf. Oliver Glasner? Six games so far. How do you feel things are going there? Is the glass not half full or half empty? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. um, We've well, taken five points from a possible 18. But right. you know. I think Glasner is a very capable manager. And if he gets a bit of time to shape the team according to his wishes, I think they're going to be a lot better. My feeling is, although Crystal Palace fans will know better, that there is maybe a slight danger that they are approaching on the beach territory uh, being safe but not really with a realistic chance of going anywhere right in this are league. they safe are they safe crystal palace are currently five points clear of the bottom three with well they've got seven a, games left yeah. seven games yeah. left they've there's got, a big yeah. gap but it's basically palace at the top of the bottom seven and then there's a there's a nine point gap to fulham who probably are on the beach mm. well the thames is tidal um, well, they've got a pool so in they literally are, Yeah, so they've got they a pool and a beat. So, yeah, they are living it's the dream. Choice. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, to sum up, probably it's going to be one point between the top three at the other end of this weekend. I mean, it's very exciting to have a three team title race. And I think title races are enlivened by the drama, as We're Tom said. We're in favour of title races. We like races. them. But if we remember back to 2018 19, which was a good title race, very close, but it was that period where Liverpool and City just won every single week. Mm. So, obviously, last time out, Liverpool dropped some points. And it does feel like this season all three teams have got that in them. Yeah. Maybe it'll happen. Maybe. So, um, well, we'll be reviewing events on Sunday evening. Of course, we'll still have Chelsea Everton to play. That's coming on Monday night. Next up, let's have a, a look at the rest of the teams. Busy battling relegation. Down the bottom, Everton on Monday got hit by another points penalty. This one for PSR breaches in a different season. Uh, They got two points for their overspending in the 2022-23 campaign. That's eight, of course, in total. It leaves them two points from the drop. And a trip to Chelsea awaits them on Monday where they haven't won now for almost 30 years. Frankly, they may well be in the bottom three by the time Monday rolls around because Luton and Forrest are just two points behind them. Luton have that trip to City. Forrest, they're home to Wolves, which is, you know, doable. Um, did anybody read the report that accompanied this two points penalty? Those who have talk of the panel's sassy asides at, the, at previous PSR penalty panels. Uh, apparently there's quite a lot of snark between the, the different people handing out these judgments. This is very much case by case. Yeah. Anyway, just the two points for the Toffees this time. And, uh, yeah, trip to Chelsea on Monday. Kind of mad that they haven't won there in 30 years, mm. given that there have been, you know, decent Everton teams, lest we forget, during that period. Um, I think the I kind of got the impression... That the sort of the 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 Everton response to the latest points deduction was was you know relief primarily mm. that it could have been worse. Um, the fact that they finally ended that that run of winless games against Burnley last weekend felt like um, a a very timely shot in the arm for their their um survival push and yeah as as has been you know sort of flagged up you look at the games that they've still got i mean you know i wouldn't put it past them to get something at, at 
this very patchy Chelsea team, but they've got Forest at home to come, Brentford at home, mm. Luton away, Sheffield United at home. Do you have quite a lot of winnable games? So it kind of feel. I, I, I suspect from an Everton perspective, they're probably thinking that having now got back to winning ways and had hopefully the last of the point sanctions that they will have to contend with this season that they are now, you know, they've kind of bottomed out and are on the on the I rebound. Would, yeah, nice. Uh, how, how worried should Brentford be, though? They're a couple of points better off than Everton, but they are facing, as you mentioned, the Toffees in a week or two. They've also got games with Luton and this weekend Sheffield United. So three direct rivals in the relegation scrap. Yeah, I mean, Brentford's next three games are Sheffield United, Luton and Everton. Mm. So that is... Yeah, what well you said, A. But B, the, that, they've then got Fulham and Bournemouth and Newcastle. Right. So I think, I think Brentford will be OK. OK. And Sheff- I mean, like, the, sorry, just to add, I mean, they're, they're nine games without a win, mm. but they were absolutely brilliant against Manchester United. If mm. they'd won that 3 0, it would not have, you know, mm. it would not have done United a disservice. Um, they did brilliantly to come back from two goals down and lead at Villa last weekend, albeit, you know, then conceded a late equaliser. Ivan Tony hasn't scored in seven games, but he's playing so well. I mean, that game against United, he was absolutely fantastic. So as much as they will probably need some goals from him if they are to, you know, put a, a bit of space between themselves and the bottom three, he, it's, it's not like he's not contributing. He's just, you know, he's just not finding the back of the net himself. All right. Sheffield United on a bit of an up upturn themselves. Burnley, meantime, who got a win last weekend. Oh, no, they actually didn't, did they? They lost to Everton last weekend. That was their first defeat, though, in five matches because they've been on a good run. They're minus six. Six off safety. They needed a bigger PSR penalty, probably, you feel. They're hosting Brighton, who are not in the best of form themselves. Only four wins in their last 16. And as mentioned, Nottingham Forest at home to Wolves, which means that for the second week in a row, Nuno Espirito Santo is up against one of his former clubs. Last time didn't work out too well. Will it this time? Probably a slightly nicer reception, I would have thought. Mm. Not that he got a hostile well, reception. Will. I think a lot of Spurs fans have just forgotten that he was even there. He will get a nice reception, probably. But Morgan Gibbs-White will not. He has right. built some beef with the Wolves fans since oh, he yeah? moved to Forest. So, yeah, that's worth keeping an eye on. OK. Also this weekend, Newcastle against Tottenham, which should be fun. Newcastle won this fixture 6-1 last season, Rafa. Hmm. They were 5 0 up after 21 minutes. It was the game when Conte had done one and uh, Christian Stellini was uh, left, you know, left behind holding the baby and he then got sacked and they brought in Ryan Mason after that. But yeah. Christian Stellini being Tottenham manager mm. felt like it happened about three years ago mm. and it was barely a year. Yeah. Also, Hugo Lloris's last appearance for Spurs. Is that right? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, hooked mm. at half time. All right. Really? What a way to bow out, yeah. Unless oh, I've invented rare that. Rare half-time tactical substitution of a goalkeeper. Yeah. And also a complete waste by Newcastle. If you get five goals in 20 minutes, hmm. the 10. The 10 was there. Hmm. Perhaps this weekend, Duncan. Also, uh, this weekend, and speaking of wasting, uh, Bournemouth are up against Man United. Game of the weekend, this. That is, yeah? Yeah. Just 5.30 on, because what? Man United, basically. Because... Narrative, yeah. What are they going to give us this time, do you think, Duncan? Well, Bournemouth are good. Mm. They obviously won away at Old Trafford this season. 3 0. Yeah. They took their chances. And everyone knows the United shots thing. But it is remarkable that this year they've faced 253 shots. The next highest is Brentford on 227. It's just, you know. It is. It's more than any other any other team in Europe's five major leagues. Manchester United are the, the kind of most generous. Yeah. Have a shot. Giver of shots. Right. And it's it's mad. I once saw Tom Williams play a game of football at Old Trafford. And did. You played alongside me. Yeah, you? but there were fewer shots in that game of rank amateurs than they are in an average Man United game. Yeah, but both sides were rank amateurs, so... Yeah, true. Uh, Rafa? I spoke to Tanaka after the game last week, ah, and okay. I was quite surprised how upbeat he was by the performance. I mean, you can sometimes understand managers trying to put a positive spin on things but he genuinely seemed to believe that United had performed and defended really well in this game Mm. and I just thought hmm how did he come across to you because he doesn't seem the most 
uh, this kind of person you could especially he's warm actually to. quite engaging in German. I think he feels ah. slightly more at ease speaking in German, um, and is always very nice uh, in front of the camera. But yeah, I was I was surprised that he seemed to think that United were just a little bit unlucky uh, not getting a better result against Liverpool, where I think by most people's standards they really should have been smashed to pieces in terms of certainly the first first half performance. But yeah, maybe maybe that explains things. Maybe he just doesn't see it. Maybe not. I do wonder. I mean, the thought that occurred to me midweek, and I've not really thought this through, so why not just air it in a podcast? That's the best way. Yeah. What was the best um, way? Ajax managers, right? So he had a great record at Ajax, and we think, yeah, great manager, bring him in. And previous example of this genre would be maybe Frank de Boer, who had a good record at Ajax, comes in at Crystal Palace, stinks the place out. Is it that Ajax is a club that, especially a year or two ago, was so set up for whoever the manager was to just reap the rewards of an institution that at all levels worked towards a single collective aim. You didn't have to come in with a, a plan. Everybody knew what they were doing. So Ten Hag was essentially administrator. When he has to go and actually build something himself in another uh, place. No, I think that would be very unfair to him. I think yeah? his Ajax team wasn't just a good team in the Dutch league. Mm. They, of course, made a massive mark in the Champions League. Of course. Which is where I think he became a name and gave people the idea that this guy taking a Dutch team in this modern age so far into big competitions can right. do something. Uh, Louis van Gaal would be a similar example, I think. Mm. It's not How did he, he do it at Old Trafford? Uh, how did he do it at Ajax? Yeah, no, in but that's Champions my League. point. At Ajax, whether it's domestically or in the Champions League, you've got players who are schooled in a I certain th- way of I playing. I think there's something that I think... Culturally, a manager who comes to England from Ajax specifically yep. comes accompanied by a, a load of expectations that you don't have if you come from PSV or Feyenoord. Or, mm. I, mean, I can't even remember the last time a coach came from either of those clubs, but, but whatever. Because Ajax, we all have this idea of what Ajax is. Right. It's 4-3-3, it's possession football, it's attacking fullbacks, like blah, 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 blah. And... You know, Ajax as a club has been geared towards that kind of football, albeit they haven't always stuck rigidly to it for decades. Mm. You know, Rince Pickles, Johan Cruyff, etc. I think it speaks to the simplification that sometimes takes place when we imagine the impact a foreign coach will have mm. at a massive institution like Manchester United. Because when United hired Ten Hag, the kind of spiel was he's going to kind of Ajaxify Man United. That's why we're going to allow him to sign all these slightly hopeless players that he worked with there. And we're going to start playing Ajax-style football. And as we've actually discovered, there there are too many uh, structural shortcomings at Old Trafford for a coach to hope to come in and put that in place. So I think that's, I think that's part of the issue mm. that, that, with, with Ten Hag. I think what... What works against him is the total absence of progression in terms of you know United style of football, the quality of their football, the fact that we are now a season and a half, nearly two seasons into the Ten Hag era, and they look less cohesive a team than I think they ever have. But great fun to watch. Yeah. But great so fun. much fun to watch, so much. I mean, unless great, you're a United fan. The great mystery is, mm. um, what is he actually trying to achieve? Because... Did you ask him, Ram? This team, well, I I sort of have. And he always seems to think that, or he always seems to say that, yeah, we are making progress and it just takes a bit more time and we have injuries. Because I asked him, we are, you've coached at Bayern, you've coached at Ajax. We expect a certain style of football. We don't really see that from this United team. Mm. How long do you think it's going to take before we see that? And I was hoping for a very substantial answer, but he was just sort of, gliding past it and saying, yeah, you know, it's difficult, etc. But th- this is, for me, um, the bigger question. Why is he even trying to play that way? Does or has he given up? Like or it, has he given it, up? The thing. It doesn't look like he it. He did yeah. it at the very start. And then they, got, they lost 4-0 at Brentford in a terrible performance. Mm. And he kind of just realised that the job's so big and the reaction when Manchester United loses. So I know, but that is nearly two years yeah. ago. Mm. And surely I mean, with the help get, of so much money, he could have well, surely, done yeah. something a little bit more. We, we're in danger of descending into another Man United. Where are they well, going? Chat. I, mean, so, I know, but we have one of these twice a week. Twice a week. Right, listener. So let me just throw this in. 
the Bournemouth Man United Saturday at 5.30 pits against each other the two individuals who've had the most shots in the Premier League this season without scoring. They are the slightly resurgent Anthony, currently on 31 without finding the back of the net. 31 shots. I can see every shot as well in my head. Can you? Can you? <laughs> it's basically the same shot. Yeah. And Bournemouth's Ryan Christie, who's got even more shots without scoring. 33, in fact. So... Ryan Christie is having a good season Trying and has, you know, has got quite an important role in the Bournemouth team. Right. Whereas Anthony is not. not so. Although he did do a nice outside of the pass assist. I mean, it's, it's not much for 90 it's million amazing. euros. Yeah. yeah. But it's something. It's All right. a start. West Ham and Fulham fans, you'll want me to note that Sunday at 2 o'clock, your teams will be facing each other. The reverse fixture having been won by the Cottagers. 5 0. They beat West Ham in December. When they were doing that a lot, they also beat Forest 5-0 around that time. West Ham, as previously mentioned, are going to be at Bayer Leverkusen tonight, as we record, Thursday. Possibly the toughest away trip in European football right now, given that Leverkusen have not lost a single game all season. What is it, 41 now they're on? 41 unbeaten? Amazing. They've not had to face David Moyes, though, have they? Well, they've not. And... England's coefficient hopes very much riding on Moisey. After well, it's looking very good now for England's coefficient after the latest round. I checked. They're to, tied. They're tied with the but Bundesliga. But they still have all these games on Thursday. Right. If they win them. Yeah. Mm. I think at least one of them will win. Okay. Dortmund, of course, lost. Yeah. Bayern could only draw against right. Arsenal. So I think it's England's fifth spot. To lose. Right, OK. So, yeah, with no involvement on Tuesdays and Wednesdays these days. So we'll see how long their advantage in first place holds out. Tom, before we wrap up, is, is there a word out there in the wider international lexicon of the sport to describe an unhealthy obsession with coefficients and the like? Uh, you may be amazed to learn, James, that yes, there is. Right. Uh, there where, is. Where can I read about words like So that? in the recently updated edition of Do You Speak Football, oh, yeah. uh, which is on shelves uh, and on sale now, yeah, uh, on there is... throughout the country. Throughout the country, yeah. there is uh, a Dutch expression, uh, coefficienten polonaise. It's all it's a big compound word. My favourite dish. And it, it basically means uh, a coefficient dance, polonaise being... You know, a traditional form of group dance. And oh, is it? Okay. What, because there's been a lot of coefficient chat in the Netherlands in recent times. They've, they've been very frequently vying for fifth place okay. in the UEFA coefficient standings with France. They've and been trounced Portugal, by France this time, They are they? being trounced by France this season. Yeah. But if, you know, Dutch teams have a positive week in right. Europe, the suggestion might be that fans of Dutch football might care to indulge in a okay. coefficient in Polonaise to celebrate that little coefficient dance. Is that really the explanation? It, that is the that is the meaning. It sounds more to me as I if... I thought it had more to do with the jostling for position, that that was the dance, but yeah. I'm assured that it's it's not. You celebrate Who with assured the you coefficient no, dance. But is, is My Dutch football linguistics Isn't there sort of a, 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 a sarcastic element to it that it's, it's meant as a... A song and dance being made about yes. something that is actually quite but boring. That's yeah, I mean, that's I, an I mean, English that's Indian song and dance. I'm not sure if that would no, but no, I th because no, but I, I mean, think that's... that is the the real meaning behind it, rather than people positively celebrating. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, just it's just, it's just, dance. just making just, a big just, fuss. Just to clarify, it. people mm. aren't literally dancing in. No, they're not Flash rushing they out will be. into the Flash streets, in the <laughs> into the streets of Volendam or whatever. It's more, you know, we're oh, great. Six above we've, Greece. We're point six above Greece. Let's all do a dance. Yeah. Brackets. I mean, roll, I wouldn't be against close it. Close brackets. There's, so. there's worse things to dance about. Mm. There are, aren't they? Just yeah. Aren't As Mr. Oizo yeah. proved all those years ago. And with that, we come to the end of today's Totally Football show. Uh, many thanks to Rafa, to Tom, to Duncan, to Liam, and producer Charlie in the booth, and you, listener. We'll have another one for you. Late, late, late Sunday, probably early Monday, actually, looking back at this weekend's Premier League action and uh, nodding forward to those ever so exciting looking second legs next week. Uh, do hope you'll join us for that. In the meantime, have yourself a great time and we'll see you soon. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around 
and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.